So back at the carousel. Uh, do you want our words? Uh, I, I assume you wrote them down, though. Right. Yeah. I will let you know you got all of the words correct. <laughs> do you think? Please tell me there's not a fifth bonus word. Uh. <laughs> Lightning round. But the so... the fall unicorn should definitely be behind the nameless one it's paired next to they're they're just next to it says they're next to each other i'm sorry i didn't write the puzzle oh okay so when characters are done painting when you get done painting the names on the uh unicorns uh a few minutes later diana cloppington because that's her last name uh comes in and she takes a look at your uh your handiwork and then Gives you a kind of a nervous smile and offers you a free a free ride on the unicorns on the on the carousel. Leonardo eagerly accepts and hops aboard the nearest one. We'll say it's Moss. <laughs> I don't know why. Mrs. Fitzbiggin sighs deeply and then mounts stone. You're already here. We might as well enjoy it. And we get a better view of the park to see if we can find that Kenku. Do we get a better view of the park, really? Looking from inside of this carousel? Well... Or is that a lie that you no. told yourself because you wanted to ride the carousel and you're looking for any excuse to do so? It's all a matter of perspective, anyway. Mm-hmm. So we oh. don't have to punch our card for this ride? It's free? No, it's free. Oh. All right, I need uh, the two of you to roll me a d6. Oh, my dice seem to have vanished. Uh, I have five. I have one. Okay. Nothing bad. It's uh, whatever. So as the carousel gets up, you hear contented whinnies from all of the unicorns. And you start to hear, as it speeds up faster and faster and faster and faster, you hear words. And Mrs. Fitzbiggins, you were told that Bavlorna Blightstraw has your missing thing. Bavlorna Brightstraw? Blight. Blightstraw. Raz, you are told that Indolin Moongrave has your missing thing. Indolin and the other two Moongrave? Yes. Can uh Bav uh, uh Mrs. Fitzbiggins, you are told that Bavlorna's lair is a rambling cottage on stilts and a face want. Leonardo, you are told that Indolin's lair is in a mountaintop theater. Mrs. Fitzbiggins, you are, you learn that Bavlorna is allergic to someone running winter shins. Do you actually know what that means? Yes. Or do I need to? Okay. All right. <laughs> I, th I actually thought you knew what that means, but I was going to define it for you. If you I, didn't. I don't. Somebody uh, well, I, running a, a counterclockwise circle. Winter Leonardo, shins means counterclockwise. You, you are told that the hag you have you seek has foreseen her own death, which happens during an eclipse. You both hear the. You both hear. Their third sister, seek. Uh, sleeps in a dollhouse and can't remember the first creature that she sees when she wakes up. You also learn that the patron of Prismere, and I need Leonardo to make me a history check, a charisma history check at advantage because you are a fey warlock. Uh, can you give me that name again? 
Prismir. So the 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 leader of Prismir is frozen in time. And then what check was that? A charisma and history check. Okay. So basically using your spellcasting modifier for a history check. And you're doing this at advantage. Oh, uh, 20 plus 3. 23. 23. The, you know that the uh, f- from your knowledge that you've gained through your Fey Pact that the leader of Prismir is an archfey by the name of Zybilna. The last piece of information that you learn is that th- the three hags have seized control of Zybilda's domain and split it among them. And together they are the Hourglass Coven. Rulers of Hither, Thither, and Yon. And then with that... Do we know which hag rules which? No. I think I got all that down. Okay. I can repeat any of the information if you need it. Uh, I mean, other than spelling, I think I'm okay. Spelling is ephemeral. It's fleeting. <laughs> it is. It's well. It's important if you're going to do this. I mean, this... if I if I say Zabilna, you know who I'm talking about, right? Right. Okay. Good enough. I know who you're talking about, but if you call Zib- if you call Zabilna Zabilna, she might get angry and turn you into a frog. Have we uh, I automatically. Actually, yes, it's a matter of perspective. Um, Leonardo would pronounce it correctly. Raz would not. <laughs> it's fine. I'm not going to hold that against you. Uh, and as you get this last piece of information, Carousel slows down, slows down, and stops. And as you get off. Diana Cloppington is waiting for you. And she uh, gives Violet's... you a ho- oh, hopeful sorry, smile. And she gives you a hopeful smile and a nod and starts to usher the next group of people onto the carousel. Uh while it's slowing down, I it, when they when the voices stop speaking to us, I suggest to Miss Fitz or Leonardo suggests to Miss Fitzbingen, should we get Turvum and Belshin to ride the carousel on their own, too? Uh, it's Mrs. Fitzbiggin, thank you. Mrs. Apologies. Is Mrs. Fitzbiggin a widow, or is she actively married? She's a widow. Okay. Uh, I actually quite suspect that whatever stuff and nonsense the other two have gotten up to Given the way that this ridiculous carnival works, they might have heard voices of their own. So after we reconvene, we'll have to, to, to compare notes and see what we've all learned. It's a good starting point. Huh? Leonardo closes his sketchbook, which looks like a bunch of blurred lines. Because uh, that's what he saw. I definitely expect that Turvum didn't immediately abandon his goal to participate in a cupcake eating contest. Irvum. As you were recovering from the cupcake eating contest, <laughs> you get up and you kind of wander. You've been sitting, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes or so because, you know, you took some custard damage and be real. Yes. So oh. you, after you uh, recover, you kind of remember why you're there and you look around and you see really nobody that catches your eye, right? Uh, nobody that looks out of place except I don't remember if I actually made a little thing for her. I didn't. Uh, you see a, a halfling playing a lute. And she's just singing some irrelevant, irreverent song about I 
Actually, you can't really understand the lyrics. Roll me charisma saving throw. That is a 22. You feel the magic of this song wash over you, and the halfling gives you a bit of a wink, and you hear all of the same information that the two of them heard from the carousel, with one exception. I need you to roll me a d6. Two. Two. You get told that your item is held by Bavlorna Blightstraw. So. And then the halfling continues on, does no longer acknowledges you, and continues to quietly strum her loot as she it's kind of kicking back in the branch of a tree. And I'll go over and and go talk to her normally. She gives you a nod, but continues to sing her little song, her jaunty little tune on her uh, on her lute, and pays you no more mind. I'm not going to interrupt it. Alright, are you done in the Feasting Orchard, or are you going to I continue su on? I suppose I should, uh, I'm going to go to the carousel, because I'm sure that uh, poor, I hope that poor, poor Leonardo hasn't been driven mad by Mrs. Fitzbiggins. Oh, it's likely the reverse, don't worry. Mrs. Fitzbiggins. And on your way out, the, uh, the halfling stops playing her lute. She says, I suggest you go... Check out the performance at the lake. And then she starts to play her the song again. I think we might. Thank you. Elshan, you've been stuck in a gondola for the last hour listening to this metaphysical discussion on the what it means to be human, what it means to be... That's uh, Yep. Uh, are you gonna? Are you doing something over here, or are you just? I am. I am just. I'm trying to be as polite as I possibly can be. And she just congratulates you on being such a wonderful conversational partner. Usually, she does not, and she's just going ten thousand miles a minute. Like you did not know that an animal could speak this much and you find yourself glad that most animals don't. Yeah. <laughs> and you come back around to the gondola swans uh, uh, dock here and yep. you get off and she uh, says, hold on a moment. And she reaches underneath her uh wing i guess mm -hmm. and she comes back with a uh small uh wrapped gift and it is another fey wild trinket another fey Thank trinket you. just for being such a dazzling conversational partner i will point out that she did most of the talking and that uh you didn't conversate all that much but she thinks you were wonderful. So I you tried. Now a, you now have a second Fey trinket. I have added that to my notes. And you are standing at the Silver Song Lake, and you know that here in the next few minutes there's going to be a performance. Yeah, I'll stay for that. And then the other three are gathered outside the carousel. So we've all been told to go see this performance at the lake. Uh, yes. Well, well, by Turvum, I would assume. Yes, I, I will say that it's been suggested that we check out the uh, performance that's we, happening shortly. 
And we know that Belsham has gone over there, so I guess that's our next stop. Right. Leonardo is going to impress upon the party that seeing as many things as possible might be helpful. So this is a good idea. I'll look at things, right, but please, I won't enjoy it. Please refresh my memory on the names of these two bugbears that are guarding the staff area. Or at least the one bugbear and his brother. Who's Hurley. It's, it's, uh, hold on. Hurley is the one that went missing, I think, in, hold on, let me double check. Hold on, I could tell Hurley you. was what I wrote down. Burley, with a B, is the one that is working in the staff area, and Hurley is the one that went missing. Yeah, and uh, when I when I catch up, I'll uh, I'll I will very frustratedly bring them up on all the gossip around town, including these two. Did anybody need these... anything repeated? I wrote down the parts that mattered to my lost item. And I think Raz yeah. got the rest. I got. I've written down everything. Um, Thank you, Raz. Leonardo is going to uh, mention that on the carousel, he and Mrs. Fitzbiggin were told information about their missing items and who has them, and some weird, some oddities about how to defeat them. He trails off. Interesting. I, there was uh, the halfling that was playing a loot that just magically gave me some of the same information. Uh, Leonardo will immediately turn to Miss Fitzpig and say, Oh, you were right! Then, uh, Belshan, did you learn anything? Belshan, I learned you... about all of the gossip of this place. He says very exhaustedly. Although, there is one thing that I believe... If I, if I remember correctly, because, you know, it was before the break, <laughs> but um, the um, the performer who's going to be performing here soon rejected the she mime. Did, she didn't reject the mime. Oh. What happened was he went to profess his love and ask her to marry him, ask him, her to marry him. He got like three words in, the words stopped ah, coming out, right. and then he right. panicked and ran away. And hasn't been back to the lake since. He has been... Yeah, he's been a caretaker over at the... Uh... All of Illusions. All of Illusions. His, uh, name, can... his name was... Uh, Candlefoot the Mime. As an aside, uh, Miss, Mrs. Fitzbingen does not get to go anywhere near the Hall of Illusions. <laughs> I see that being terrible. Oh, look, it's all mirrors. <laughs> I just point out how everything's done. As you guys are, are standing there and talking, uh, mist starts to gather at the banks of the Shimmering Lake. Near its center, a giant clam raises up. And in the center of it, a mermaid lounging in a giant bowl. She starts singing a glorious, haunting song that captivates all the spectators on the lake shore. And in response, the lake water coalesces into magical sculptures that whirl around and as she performs. Shapes, animals, stars and constellations. Swirls and all kinds of wonderful effects. Uh, what do you do? You're kind of at the bank. You can still get closer. I point out that it's all done with mirrors. It. Like what? I point out that it's all done with smoke and mirrors. They've got no, mechanisms. no. Those are at the Hall of Illusion. <laughs> They've got mechanisms pumping uh, mist out over the lake. You are literally a fey rabbit person. Yes, and okay. I, I just it's giving away all the fey secrets. It's always been like that, right? I mean, it's kind of duh, it's magic, but while Leonardo is drawing, once he's got the drawing mostly done, he's going to cast Detect Magic to add another layer onto his drawing. Uh, as you cast Detect Magic, you can do that as an action for free because you took the stupid... Yeah, I just get it for free forever. The right, Warlock yeah. Light Switch. Yep. Uh, you see that 
the water has a very strong aura of transmutation magic, and the and you can tell that the magic is coming from the the voice of the mermaid as she sings. As you're watching, she also summons a swarm of whippers, those little fish that you can turn you can polymorph people into, or, or summon as a familiar, and they start obeying her commands and like jumping through water hoops and things like that. Yeah, I can literally do that. As you guys are, the three of you are watching Mesmerized, and Mrs. Fitzbiggins is just standing there complaining. <laughs> uh, you hear somebody, well, you hear several people uh, start to jeer at the mermaid. After the third of these mean-spirited jeers, the mermaid kind of falters in mid-song the water crashes to the ground and she leaps out of her bowl and darts off heading downriver this way well now just because it's all smoke and mirrors doesn't mean it's polite to heckle so i'm gonna turn and glare at the hecklers for i need you to make me a perception check sure i had a d20 here but somebody stole it I'm assuming it was fey magic. It's going to be a 21, my dude. Well, I rolled a one. Okay. And you come face to face with a black feathered Kenku who is like just using voices, using its mimicry ability to heckle the warlock, the warlock, the, uh, Mermaid. Do I see this Kenku near? Mr. I mean, you could roll me a. Oh, I thought she was like literally next to it. No, she's not like. Oh, okay. Mrs. Fitzbiggins actively is looking for the perception. With yeah, perception uh, I would like to look for the Hector as well. I will, I will point this Kenku out and say, oh, look. Yeah, you got you like Mrs. Fitzbiggins, her immediate disapproval and like this. Okay. Kinku locks eyes with you. I have like a complain dar that just hones in <laughs> on Plain the target dar. of my ear. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just keep my gaze. Leonardo will just focus on this Kenku wherever it is. He's gonna follow it with his eyes, and if it's ever by itself with not anybody near, like relatively close by, let me know. Uh, the Kinku flees after catching. Mrs. Fitzbiggins' eyes and starts running down the main. I cast sleep on the Kenku. Okay. Roll the dice. I don't actually know how many dice I get. Just a second. So the problem with sleep is that you're, it's an area of effect that's going to affect well, lowest I, HP I spe- first. I specifically so, mentioned when he is isolated, I want to do this. Well, you 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 pick the targets in sleep. You don't have to pick. Oh. It's, all, mm-hmm. it's targets you pick. It's not everybody in there. It? 5d8, okay. Does anybody go after Palatia? That is... uh, Yeah, I'll go after her. Almost. uh, You see the Kinku stagger a bit, but does not... uh, But she... It... It's a she. She doesn't uh, stop running. She keeps running. I'm going to chase after the Kenku, I think. Okay. Oh, we're splitting the party again. You should never do that. We're doing it. Oh, I'm chasing after the Kenku as well, but you hop faster than I do. I think I do, yeah. (laughs) Uh, Not wanting to leave uh, Belshan alone, Leonardo will go that way. Okay. So the two of you are chasing after the Kenku. And the two of you are going to check on Palatia. Yep. So. A few minutes of searching, you find Palatia basically just she's by this rock here uh, down down river. And she's crying her heart, her eyes out. 
And she starts like if if you approach her, she like talks about how there are no more heroes in the world and like true love doesn't exist and she's lost all faith and everything and then like nobody can prove her otherwise. While you're dealing with the crying inconsolable mermaid, uh how much is y'all's movement speed? Uh twenty five thirty but you can jump an additional what ten feet? How often can I do that? Uh, your proficiency bonus. All right. So yeah, I, I can need... rabbit hop twice. <laughs> so if she's dashing and you're dashing, so I would say you guys started twenty feet away from her before, and she didn't get a full round away from you. Okay. Because you saw her real quick. And she hesitated a moment before you started chasing her. So she is running forward through a crowd. And you guys are following in her wake. So what I need is either, I'll let you pick, you can try to slip through the crowd. Or you can try to barrel through the crowd. That's dex or strength. Can I hop over the crowd? I will let you use your hop to hop over the crowd. Uh, if you use both uses of it, I will say you automatically pass the check. Yeah, no problem. All right, so I'm I need either a, I need a strength or a uh, dex check from Turvel. Uh, I will try and barrel through the crowd, even though I know how well that went last time. That's a two. Uh oh, <laughs> that is a two. I'm not barreling through anyone. Uh, ye... you can make this roll at advantage because you're following in the the wake of <clears throat> somebody who and is. I I am the human. I am the dwarven cannonball. <laughs> like, because uh, this Kinku is already knocking people out, and she gets about here. And behind the... I mean, she's dodging behind, like, stalls and things like that, trying to trip people over to you. But Mrs. Fitzbiggins just jumps over everything she, ch she throws at her. And she gets about right here, and she trips and falls face first in the ground because I rolled a two. And you guys corner her right here. All right. What do you do, if anything, to res do you restrain her? What? I lean heavily on my quarterstaff. I tell her that we saw what she did at the dragonflies, and that if she comes along quietly, nobody's going to get hurt. She puts up both of her hands and says, "Wait, wait, wait," and she says she's speaking with a masculine voice. Okay. She introduces herself. My name is Kettlesteam. I am here because there's something not right at this carnival. Yes, there's many things not right at this carnival. I've been trying to convince my companions of that all day long. She gives you like a very long look. Well, we thought it was you. Who a couple was, of times great... and then looks at Turvum. Listen, there are things that are not as they seem at this carnival. And she basically proceeds to uh with the combination of like you saying yeah there's lots wrong with this carnival and whatever but she's just decided not to speak to mrs fitzbiggins i'm sorry that's fair uh she says that she is a warlock who has made a fey pack with the arch fey zybilna uh but recently She's, through various means, she's become convinced that something is amiss with her patron. 
uh, she has this sense that Z- Zybilna is no longer in touch with her. And she is very disconcerted by this. Uh, she wants to question the carnival owners about Prismir, but they keep giving her the cold shoulder. So she has decided, because she is convinced they know more than they're letting on, that she is just going to cause trouble until they have no choice but to come talk to her. But they have been ignoring her the entire time. So by cause trouble, she means almost get that blue-haired dwarf killed. She kind of shrugs at you. She shrugs when I point out that she almost got a man killed? Uh, she's chaotic neutral. She just kind of shrugs. And, and, And you see me cross my arms with a scowl on my face. Uh, and then, like, when you scowl, she raises her hands up even higher, and she says, listen, listen. And again, she's speaking to you fluently in a single voice. Give me a uh, history check, both of you. Uh, this is Kenku don't speak fluently like that. Right. You basically, th- I would consider this co- pretty common knowledge, so you don't got to roll high. A 22. Yeah. And... Uh, what skill was that? Uh, history. You just need an eight. Yeah, it's an eight. Okay. Would you just recall something dimly that Kinku don't have their own voice? So, as she's explaining this, you kind of peg there's something going on. But, she raises her hand and says, uh, hold on, hold on, I've got proof. And then she repeats the conversation, a converse, another conversation, and as she slips into a different voice, uh, she slips into a voice that both of you recognize as Mr. Light. Someone is going to find out about us. They'll shut us down. Followed by another voice that you also recognize. Because remember, you have spoken to Witch and Light when you were children. Uh, as Witch's voice, we agreed to this pact. Our hands were forced, but our eyes were open. We let the Hourglass Coven take what it wants, and in return, we stay in business. That is what you want, right? And again, she reiterates that she's only causing trouble in the carnival until Witch and Light tell her what she wants to know. But even after she figures out what's going on, she can't really do anything about it because part of her uh, fey pact is that she cannot willingly enter Prismere. Tervum, can you think of a good reason to not take this woman into custody and turn her over to the park authorities? Maybe we'll tell them that uh, we'll surrender her, but only to Mr. Witch and Mr. Light directly. Isn't that what she she wants anyway? She shakes her head. No, they'll just escort her off the grounds and then you won't have any leverage. He goes, I can help you. Hmm. We can, we can steal Mr. Light's uh, magical uh, weather vane. And, I, uh, if you tell her, uh, I'll box her ears if she she suggests robbing from yeah. people. And again, if you flip over the uh, the tickets, you can see a picture of it. It's also right here. She says, "Well, if we steal it, we can force them to to tell us what we want to know, or you just get kicked out in the act." And she shakes her head. No, she says they need the they need the weather vane. The they need it. It it's a the carnival doesn't run properly without it. So why didn't you do that instead of I don't know endangering the lives of innocent dragonfly riders? I'm only one person, and besides, it helps to have a backup plan. No. Is Turvum Mr. going for this let's steal from the carnival idea? Absolutely not. Okay. I, uh, I feel like she's talking to the wrong two people in the party. <laughs> oh, she's definitely talking to the wrong two people. Leonardo would be like, this sounds like a fantastic idea. Both of you, by the way, know that she is not, like, the voice thing. That is another thing. Like, she's not a Kenku originally. No, she's a Kenku. There is no magic... Op- around her that you passively detect to indicate she is bespelled in any way. She is, as you see, as before you see her, 
And she has demonstrated the mimicry ability on several occasions. You saw her use it on... But she's still speaking with her own voice, though. She's speaking with a voice. With a voice. You gonna ask her about it? We might have misheard what you were describing earlier. Because we thought maybe there was something special about this Kenku. Yeah, I misinterpreted that as well. Uh, yeah, I asked her whose voice she stole. And she pulls out a straw doll and says that some idiot who wasn't using it for anything good. What? What is the doll of? Like, what does the doll depict? It is a, just a small straw... Uh, let me... With this, uh, a corn husk doll with a thorny stem tied around its neck. It's got a white face paint on it. I reach down and take the doll. And, okay. I tell her it doesn't belong to her. uh, Make me a... uh, She's... I tell you what, make me a... Grapple check. A grapple check? Oh, this is not going to go well. Uh... That's my, my minus one it. to athletics. <laughs> Ooh, that's a four, yo. Hey, what she up? snatches it from you, but she does look to be slightly intimidated by you, so I need both of you. Uh, one, you can both make a, an intimidation or persuasion check if you want to, like, do you want to go raw, you want to go uh, carrot or stick here? Uh, make me a... Is that a rabbit joke? Intimid- uh, make me either a charisma intimidation or a charisma persuasion check. I'm bad at both of these. I'm worse. Oh, at... I'm good at both, but roll badly. Uh, that's a 12. Uh, intimidation. All right. Just breeze right past that. I love it. I got an 11 on intimidation. Uh, you don't quite manage to pull it off, Mrs. Fitzbiggins, because you're an old rabbit lady, but Turvum is a young... Uh, man dressed in armor who has i presume an axe a battle axe yes and he she does hand over the uh the doll and the dc was 12 by the way (laughs) look we don't disagree that there are some strange things going on that aren't right but you're going about this the wrong way All right, uh, she goes, well, and she says, okay. Uh, and this time she speaks in a mis- mishmash, mishmash of various voices. She says, fine, well, I will give you till the end of the day, and then I'm going to continue on with my plans. And then she casts a uh, invisibility and disappears. Oh, uh, I want. I, I launch at her to try and grab her. Be, where at her last known location? Okay, make me an attack roll at disadvantage. Yeah, I kind of want to roll uh, initiative on that because <laughs> I have the perfect response to her going invisible. Yeah, sure. Roll initiative. Also, my initiative is really good because I'm a rabbit. Well, my attack roll would have been a nine with this advantage, so. All right. Can either of you beat a 24? No. (laughs) Hold on, initiative. My my initiative modifier is a negative one. Mine's a plus four, and I just uh, rolled poorly. Hold on. Excuse me. Uh, Let me see. It's not a... Hold on. What is... Her initiative modifier is plus three, excuse me. So 23. You need me to do 23? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only natural 20 I ro- I've rolled so far. Good time to do it. Yeah, I guess. So she gone. And she has said that she will give you to the end of the day. And you have a... Uh... She did not tell you who the voice belongs to, did she? I know who the voice belongs to. So, you have that. Uh, I suspect I know who it belongs to as well. The other two ran off to chase after that mermaid, so I think we should hook back up with them. Right. It seems like we can tie up, like, four side quests all at once here. Yep. 
I agree. Let's yeah, go. Yeah, she was that way. All right, and as you are, the as the uh, second hour comes to an end. Should we do our mermaiding before hour two ends, or? Uh, she is inconsolable. There is, uh, it would take an act of gallantry that, uh, related to something that she has basically told, she was crying about, to get her to come out from behind her rock. Well, I am an artist, so that is not my domain. Well, Sorry. actually, I'll show her the picture. <laughs> the picture from of behind what? the rock. I drew her performance. And she just starts wailing even louder. After a few minutes of dealing with this crying mermaid woman, uh, oh, and by the way, Palacia brings the mood of the carnival down one point. Like, I, I, I want to keep it, like, right here in the middle. I don't want to see what happens if we top it off or bottom it out. Oh, well, then we're doing great. Yeah. Uh, hey, then we don't, don't get to see uh, Mr. Light. So, unless uh, our good friend uh, Leonardo has a great performance for the big top. Um, yeah. So, the four of you meet back up and kind of take notes and you show him the doll and what do you do now well tell the mermaid that we have her would-be lover's voice doll back she cries and says she doesn't believe you I she won't believe you she she's it's just a doll she doesn't believe you until her her beloved candlefoot comes and expresses her his, her his love for her then give us just a moment and leonardo suggests that the party go to the hall of illusions yeah. The place that you said you didn't want to take Mrs. Fitzbiggins. Well, that's exactly where we're taking her. Exactly. <laughs> yep. It has become a matter of urgency. <laughs> All right. I'd just like to point out we've been playing for like two and a half hours and Triple has not hit any of us with a car yet. <laughs> he tried to hit someone with a dragonfly. Uh, I need everybody to roll me a dexterity saving throw as a Buick comes out from behind. <laughs> <laughs> with a zombie with a turban on his head. Oh no, six. Oh no. Not good. Fifteen. Yeah. <laughs> as you approach the Hall of Illusions, you see a, a very large tent with uh and as you're walking down the road you you get to here and you see a glass cabinet standing near the entrance of this tent in front of it you see uh a sign that's oh so okay a wooden mannequin of a grinning raven-haired young woman in witch's attire, and a green flowing cape hovers inside the glass cabinet. At the top of the cabinet, a sign reads, Tasha the Wizard, known for her hideous laughter. A halfling, ha, ha, ha. a halfling couple is holding hands as they approach the glass cabinet. One of the halflings is wearing butterfly face paint, face paint. As he drops to one knee and pulls a small box from his pocket, his sweetheart bursts into laughter and begins rolling on the ground. The halfling in face paint begins sobbing, sticking his hand in his arms, and immediately darts into the nearby tent without getting his ticket punched. There you see a mime who kind of tries to stop him, but as he, like, opens his mouth to cry out, no sound comes from his voice. So, I need a DC 15 intelligence history check from all of you. Ooh. Four. Uh, I have a four as well. I'm actually training. Six, hey, that's, that's six, that's, uh, six failures, by the way, Brickroad. This is literally the subject that Mrs. Fitzbiggin teaches. <clears throat> well, I got you all beat with a three. You know what? Since it's part of your background, I'll let you make that an advantage, Brickroad, since you're a history teacher. Oh, okay. 
It's is not is not from pity. There we go. About a twenty one. That's about twenty one will do it. Uh Mrs. Fitzbiggins, you recall that the name Tasha was one of the is the, the one of the people one of the names that uh reputably used by Igwill the Witch Queen, a legendary archmage. Uh, does any of do any of you approach the laughing halfling and the uh statue? No, it's not a statue, it's a wooden mannequin. And so I that's probably important, by the way, Burke Road. Tasha is Igwilv. By the way, in uh, before second edi- before third edition, Igwilv and Tasha were two separate characters. That I feel like a... Tasha wrote a book, which is where I learned how to be the type of druid I am. Probably. <laughs> Ridiculous. Uh, but no, I'm not going to approach the halfling because I feel like that means I would approach the mannequin, and I feel like the mannequin is what's causing the halfling to laugh hideously. Well, okay, does anybody else approach the the oh. uh, halfling? Well, I'm more... I'm more interested in the mine. foot. Yeah. Okay. So, mine. Yeah. I need to know if any. Like, how far are you skirting this? It is important. Uh, how about a twenty-foot radius? Okay. <laughs> Anybody else getting closer, or are you just you gonna leave not that poor woman just on the ground? I will advise uh, my companions not to approach the mannequin. I mean, I detect I will... magic it. I will invoke a uh, a withering glare from Mrs. Fitz and Biggle. Fitz and Biggle? No, no, no. Yeah, Fitz Biggin. We we can't Try just get that wrong as many ways as I possibly can throughout the course of this campaign. <laughs> That's what well, I'm and, and, as we're walking by, it's like, I mean, I'm a little concerned. Shouldn't we? Can we do something? Yeah, I'm. I'm Any, anyone have a, to help her up? Anyone have a rope? So, are you approaching her to help her up? Yeah. Okay. I need a saving throw from you, sir. I don't know who the hell Tasha is. That's true. <laughs> uh, it's a DC 13 wisdom saving throw. Hey, Burkhart, that's seven failures. Okay. You fall down on the ground as affected by the spell Tasha's hideous laughter. Yep. Yeah. After about 30 seconds, though, the woman gets up and she looks around panicked. And then she's like, and she says, uh, she slaps you awake. Well, she slaps you in the face lightly and it dispels the spell. Oh. And she's, she's like, where's Reuben? Where did Reuben go? He just ran inside the Hall of Illusions. I think he ran off toward that. Yeah. What he said. And she <sighs> runs into the, uh, she oh. runs towards the entrance of the Hall Don't of Illusions. Don't forget to get your ticket punched. But she is stopped by Candlefoot the Mime. Ooh. As you approach the Hall of Illusions, the large tent is painted with a mural of shifting images that show grinning fairies diving into pools of colors. The helical stripes of the tent's pointed canopies rotate in spirals, and the whole display seems designed to befuddle onlookers. You, you see a clown, who you know as Candlefoot the Mime, dressed in muted garb, and he stands in front of the tent's interest, blocking the uh, entry of the female halfling and blinking owlishly at you. I pull out the doll. He points at a sign that says one ticket punch. <laughs> yeah, I pull out the doll. I'm going to ignore him. I'm not, I don't want to go in the Hall of Illusions anyway. See if he reacts to the doll. And he doesn't. He doesn't? I mean, yeah, he doesn't. Doesn't recognize the... So, uh... Um, you know, we hadn't really thought this through. It's like, we have the doll that has his, has your voice, but does anyone know how to give it back to him? Is the doll even magical? Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah, we think a Kenku stole your voice and imprisoned Look. it within this doll. Like, we're going to try to give it back to you. He reaches out. Both hands. Makes a gimme gimme motion. I hand it to him. He does. The doll immediately bursts into flames, and he grasps his throat and goes. He goes. Yes. I can. 
I can speak. I was going to have him say, like, the brown fox jumps up, but I can't remember the, <laughs> the thing. Um, the, the mnemonic. So, like, just pretend he said that. And then he brightens up, says thank you very much, and then runs off. In the direction of goes, the mermaid's rock, hopefully. Yes. Yep. That's exactly where he's going. That Leonard turned the looks, halfling woman. Leonard looks very excited and says... And the halfling runs inside the Halls of Illusion. Without getting her ticket her. punched. Free Without Hall getting... of Illusions! So... Leonardo's going inside. Mm -hmm. As well, you go inside, the... Go ahead. It was Mrs. Fitzbiggin's intention to follow the mine back to the rock, and she thinks she's doing that, but she inadvertently also follows Leonardo inside. Okay. <laughs> Are you like? Are you searching? No. Are you searching for Reuben, or are you just just want to partake of the Hall of Illusions? I mean, a little column A and column B here. <laughs> I'm gonna chase after Candlefoot. Okay. I mean, a... see everything, get as much information as possible, see every perspective, right? Okay. Uh, and, and, and there's <laughs> lots of them in the Hall of Illusions. It's literally the name. What is Turvin doing? And you see Turvin. It's like, well, were we going back to? Uh... All right, uh, let, let's go follow Candlefoot. Yeah. All right, so the two of you are after Can. Oh, that's Leonardo. This way, after Candlefoot. After about a minute uh, searching through the Hall of Illusions, I, looking, using like extremely sarcastic air quotes there for Reuben. Uh, you come across. The halfling, gazing worriedly into a mirror. Which one? The Just a female? mirror. Uh, no, no, the which male. halfling? The male. Okay. The male. The, the female uh, basically entered. You, you haven't seen the female. She's lost somewhere in the Hall of Illusions. So, uh, if it's it's the male halfling, I'm going to tell him, Oh, we found you! Um, uh, he seems to not be able to hear you. Uh, Raise uh, my hand in front of hello? his face. Hello? Uh, you guys uh, come up, and he is gazing into the mirror. And inside the mirror, uh, can a little girl in a pig mask can be seen in the pane, whispering to a youthful reflection of the halfling. Can, uh, as, can we make out uh, what she's whispering? Uh, no, you are a good distance away. Okay. Uh, and it has been more than three minutes. So, uh, as you come come upon him. He steps into the mirror to join the girl into the pig mask and passes through the pain. His useful reflection takes the girl, uh, which is all there is now. So, like, he basically steps into the mirror. You see his youthful reflection take the girl in the pig mask's hand and walk away with her. The ring he intended for his sweetheart drops to the floor inside the hall as he disappears. Well, that's horrifying. He's Leonardo just, yeah. turns around to Mrs. Fitzbacon and says... That's not normal. No, right? he's, he's gone. He, that's after it for a him. after a few minutes, the uh, female halfling walks up, and she says, "Have you found him? Have you found Reuben?" I hand her the ring and I say that I have yeah. bad news for her. <laughs> she no, listens. no, she's she. I mean, Leonardo's going to point into the mirror, and then she says, and she runs to the mirror and starts groping at it, but is unable to pass through the mirror as he did. Can we get back behind well, the mirror? By chance? It's, it, yeah, it's just freestanding. What's behind it? The back of a mirror. Okay. Well, I think we did what we could here. And after a few minutes, she goes out and she's sobbing. And word gets around that a person has disappeared. And the, the mood of the carnival falls. I, a step. I feel like 40 people must die or go missing every day at this carnival. Actually, no. <laughs> it's closer to probably 10 or 15. You know, I'm quite glad we didn't use a punch on that. <laughs> yeah, that that was... <laughs> I will remember that until the end of my days. I leave the Turbum. Hall of Illusions, but I don't know the way out. <laughs> Turvum, like, you're so... Like, Mrs. Fitzbiggin, like, if Leonardo, if you do not stop her, she will, like, it, get you super lost. It takes you. us 20 minutes to get out, and we've only walked in four feet. 
<laughs> Tervum, Belshen, while the two while the two of them are lost in there, you make your way back up here, and you find Candlefoot and the mermaid uh hugging, and he bends down, pulls up, and pulls out a ring and asks her to marry him. She hugs him, says yes. She just she's crying again, but this time they're tears of joy. And she looks at you and she's 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 just thanking you in like these sobs. She is so happy. Elbows and uh, uh she, elbows the paladin says, Good deed done for the day, eh? And I'm up to two. <laughs> you more. And then uh, like, you see a smile on my face. And then she says, I'll go back and finish the song. And she goes back and finishes her performance, causing the mood of the to rise to, plus another for word getting around that Candlefoot has gotten his voice back. Oh no, we're getting pretty close wow. to... Wow! Uh... I was going to say the balance must be maintained, and then this happened. Uh, <laughs> she also offers the two of you a... Uh, a free singing lesson after the end of her uh, performance, if you want to take it. You know, sure. well, words of my deeds, you know, would would be even better in song. So, and that. Uh, so, the performance continues on, ends up. The two of you, I guess, eventually get out and join up. And are you going to uh, take, are the two of you going to take the singing lessons yes actually yeah okay uh you spend the uh a few minutes i don't know this 20 we'll say spend about half an hour she gives you some generally helpful uh like tips on how to like sing and things like that and perform and project your voice and uh there must be a little bit of magic to it because you definitely can sing a lot better than you were you could before Yay! And that leads us to the midpoint of the carnival, and the big top extravaganza is starting. Ah, uh, yes, where I'm required to make a fool of myself more than I already have. It's okay, I know how to do magic spells. Like, I can definitely... So as you approach the uh, big top. The roof of this tent reaches towards the night sky in three swooping peaks, topped with spinning gold stars. Painted wooden uh, panels on the tent's walls whirl with colorful motion, displaying vibrant circus performances. The sound of music and laughter drifts out from the canvas door. As you walk in, you see... Dozens of acts in progress. We see a tiny firefly circus managed by an ogre dressed like a Dijin. There's a halfling contortionist in one corner who fits himself inside of a hat box. There are pixies racing chariots pulled by weasels. Uh, there's a satyr fiddler whose music is causing these plants to burst from the ground and start dancing. Troops of eight clowns launching themselves from a magic cannon. A, t a tiefling fire breather who summons capering magma mephits and smoke mephits that disappear after a few moments. In one corner, there's a goblin juggler who can just who just catches and juggles any tiny objects that is tossed to her by the various people in the crowd. And as she gets up to eight objects, everything falls to the ground, suspended it is, is magically suspended in air, and then she starts the process over again. Uh, and finally, you see an elf ballerina who dances with an animated costumes that spring from a magic wardrobe. As you're kind of getting your bearings in this place, the lights dim and a hush falls over the crowd. A second later, a spotlight illuminates a lithe elven figure sitting in a silver hoop. Uh, 